Hey everyone, um, my name is Bryce Crabb. I am one of the house leaders, one of the house group leaders alongside my uh, wonderful wife, Sarah Crabb. Um, she is my best friend. I love her a lot. Um, and another one of my really good friends, Lainey, um, who is Ryan's wife. Um, they're both just such a, such a wonderful um, group leaders, and it's just been such a treat to, to serve alongside them. And I, I just I look forward to Tuesday nights being a part of our group and, and getting to not only invest in, in others and facilitate the conversation, but getting to serve alongside them has been um, just, just such a blessing. Um, I've, I've gotten to know over the last year Ryan and Lainey um, as, a, as a married couple, and they, um, they're just so wonderful. They're some of the most wonderful people I've ever known. And um, you, you normally don't get to see the behind the scenes of, uh, of Ryan shepherding this ministry, the hours in prayer he spends and the thoughtful conversations and studying and um, intentional building out of, of everything he does with the house. And I just want you to know that man like cares for you and for your soul. He loves you and um, I'm just so thankful to serve alongside him. I'm so thankful that he's asked me to teach. Um, I'm, I'm just, I'm so grateful to be at the same place at the same time um, with so many awesome house group leaders. And it's, it's just, this is, this is a special place. And I uh, just wanted to say that before we got going. Um, so thank you all for being here. Thanks Ryan for letting me teach. And today, tonight we're going to be in um, John chapter two, verses 13 through 25. It's a familiar story, but if you want to turn there and uh, read along with me. John chapter 2, 13 through 25 says this. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture, and the word that Jesus had spoken. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. So my question for us tonight is, what the heck do we do with this text? What do we do with it? Jesus is whipping people and flipping over tables. He's mad. He's mad at people selling birds in church. What's going on? How do we apply this now today? I'm convinced that this is one of the least understood, understood scriptures involving Jesus in, in the whole canon, in the whole New Testament. Um, I've often heard this preached as Jesus having righteous rage, getting mad that people were doing business in a place that should be for worship. And I've even heard it that it's an example for us, that there should be occasions where we imitate Jesus and act violently when someone or something is defying the Lord. Those are two ways you can interpret it. Um, but I'm, I want to learn, I want to think critically tonight how how do we apply this? How should we interpret this? And we learned from Ryan last week that just before this, Jesus was in Cana and performed the first of seven miracles in the Gospel of John, where he turned water into wine. And he did such a great job sharing that with us. 
So what I think this text is teaching us, and I'm going to seek to prove it, but what I think it's teaching us is do not try to overthrow Jesus' authority. Rest in Jesus' authority. So two things. Do not try to overthrow Jesus' authority. Instead, rest in Jesus' authority. So let's break down this text and understand um, what's going on amidst all the chaos. So the first four verses, we see the scene in the temple. And I think in the, in the temple, we learn that we shouldn't manipulate God's people for selfish gain. Or do not spiritually abuse God's people for your own pleasure. I think that's what we learn. I'll show you why. Um, verse 13 is where we start. It gives us some context. It says, the Passover of the Jews was at hand. So all good Jewish men would have gone to Jerusalem three times a year for different festivals. And one of those festivals was Passover. Uh, Passover was the major festival. It was kind of like, uh, it was like Christmas, like the, the, the seasons change and um, the people would hang stuff. I mean, it was um, the biggest festival of the whole year in Israel, in Jerusalem. And Passover is to celebrate the passing over of Jewish houses when God executed the last plague in Egypt, which was killing the firstborn sons. If they put the blood of the lamb over their doorposts, then the angel of death skipped over those homes and did not kill the firstborn. So that ended up being the final plague and the one that ultimately let, uh, uh, convinced Pharaoh to let the people go. So that's how they left the slavery in Egypt. And so they celebrate each year. Still do to this day, Jews still do celebrate Passover. So it also says that they went up to Jerusalem. And, and the reason it says went up is because that's geographically what happens when you're going from Capernaum, where he was just previously, to Jerusalem. Now, the Galilee area where Capernaum is, is low. It's a lake, so that means water has to flow down to where it is. Um, so you would have to go up over 3,100 feet in elevation on the way to Jerusalem. And just to give you a um, wacky comparison of how high that is, that's if you stacked 10 Bass Pro pyramids on top of each other. That's how high <laughs> we're talking about. I, I got really lucky. I got to go about a year and a half ago to Jerusalem. And as you travel from the Galilee area to Jerusalem, your ears stop, start to pop. And then maybe an hour later, while you're still climbing the embankment, your ears start to pop again. You, you've experienced this, I'm sure, if you've been to the Smokies or anything like that. But um, it's up there. It's surprisingly high in elevation. So we encounter the beginning of our issues, everything that's going on in verse 14. Um, John tells us that there's people selling oxen, sheep, and doves, along with money changers. Now, there's a courtyard right outside the temple area, um, and that's where this was going on. It was kind of on, on this road right beside the temple. Um, but my question is, what's the significance of this? I mean, why is he telling us about oxen and sheep and doves? Was there a livestock auction going on? Like, were they just trying to sell off some... Some doves to some people? Like, what's going on here? If we, if we understand rightly the Old Testament and the Old Testament law, we see that oxen and doves and sheep are animals that are used as sacrifices in the Old Testament in order for us to have a right relationship with God. So, um, it's also important to understand that we know what's going on at this time in Jerusalem. So God commanded the Jews to make sacrifices when they came to the temple, right? So when people came to visit Jerusalem for one of these big festivals, they couldn't bring their own sacrifices because it's way too far away. It doesn't make sense. You wouldn't bring your ox for a two and a half day walk and you have to carry food and supplies for the ox all the way there. No, you just go to Jerusalem, you buy the ox, and then you have it sacrificed by the priest. Or um, it doesn't make sense to carry a heavy birdcage with a couple of doves in it. You, you just go and you purchase the doves there and then they're sacrificed in Jerusalem. So there was a cartel. I'm not making this up. <laughs> there was a cartel that ran the stands. The cartel was head by high priest Annas at the time. Um, so it was owned by a bunch of corrupt priests in Jerusalem and in the surrounding areas. So they, it was all the stands, anywhere you could get a sacrificial animal was owned by this one cartel. They all were in business together and they knew that they had a captive audience during these huge festivals. 
So this cartel of greedy priests hiked up the prices for the sacrifices more than 10 times the average cost. More than 10 times the cost for these animals. So I did a little research. Uh, right now, you can buy a dove for about $65 on average. Pretty good dove. You can get cheaper, but for a pretty average dub, $65 right now. In the Old Testament, normally you needed two doves to make a sacrifice, so that's 130 bucks. So you're thinking, okay, go to Jerusalem three times a year, 130 bucks a pop for, for the sacrifice budget. Um, that's doable. You can save up money, you can, you can do that. But imagine going there and coming up to the, uh, the place where they're selling these, these animals and you say, I need two doves. And they say, uh, yeah, that'll be $1,300. You'd say, what? Are you kidding me? I can get this for 130 bucks back home. Even better, I know a guy. And they say, yep, yeah, 1300 bucks. You say, okay, yeah, sure. You go to the next stand and you say, I'll take two doves. Those people were trying to rip me off at $1,300 for two doves. Can you believe it? And they say, yep, yeah, it's 1300 bucks. Take it or leave it. No one would sell you one for less than 10 times the cost. So if you're middle class or you're lower class and you were just trying to honor the Lord by sacrificing the animals that he told you that you needed to sacrifice in order to have a right relationship with him, you couldn't do it. You couldn't afford it. It would send you into debt temporarily or maybe long term, depending on what you did. So this is the situation that Jesus is walking into. He's not angry because people are selling animals at church or they're having a livestock auction at church. That's not why he's mad. He's mad because the priests are robbing the people blind. He's mad because they're profiting off the people's genuine desire to obey God. And they're doing it on temple grounds. They're doing it basically inside the church. We actually know for a fact that these dudes were filthy rich. When I went to Jerusalem, we went into an underground area that had just been excavated. And it was a first century Jewish priest's home. We saw ornate mosaic tilings that were absolutely beautiful all over the floor and fresco paintings still preserved to today on the wall. Those things in the ancient world you would find of one of two places. You would either find it in a Herodian palace, in the king's palace, one of them, or you'd find it in a priest's home. They were pocketing this money. They were uber wealthy because they were ripping these people off. So, with that context in mind, understanding what's really going on, I want to reread verses 14 through 16 with that in mind so you can see Jesus' actions from that view, right? So let's pop back to 14 through 16, okay? So Jesus goes to the temple and the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there and making a whip of cords. He drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. Strong words for these people. Now, we need to remember that this is just a recap of what's going on. John is just giving us a sliver. There were animals running around. He was flipping tables with paper on them. Papers were going into the air. There was change on them. Coins were plinking to the ground. Money changers were grabbing their bags of coins and running the opposite way while Jesus was whipping them. It was total and utter chaos that was going on. We like to think of this calm Buddha Zen Jesus, but that was not this Jesus. He was angry, out of breath, wide-eyed and furious. And by the way, if you read Revelation, you get another view of this angry, furious Jesus. He's coming back. It's not a flaw as a part of his character, it's a feature. So John makes a narrative quote for us in verse 17 from the disciples' perspective. And he quotes Psalm 69.9. It's a Davidic psalm. David wrote it. Um, it says, For zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. 
And that means, reproach means insults. So the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. Another way, way to say it. David says, Lord, I am so one with you. I am so convinced that I am in you and you are in me. That when people insult you, it feels like it in, you, they insult me. When people come after you, it feels like they're coming after me. The disciples are saying that David wrote about Jesus in the Old Testament and that Jesus is the fulfillment of the words they already know so well. Jesus was zealous. He had righteous, holy anger towards the people that were manipulating God's people and using them for their own worldly and selfish gain. Now, I, I grew up a uh, Southern Baptist and went to the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. It's where I got my degree. So I have a lot of friends and family and a lot of ties to the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, and recently in the SBC, we've seen pastors that didn't take serious claims of sexual abuse. The SBC Executive Committee was already um, recently exposed for mishandling hundreds of sexual abuse cases across the nation. There were hundreds of cases of pastors sexually abusing women and children, and the executive committee kept it quiet because they thought that information would hurt their mission. Now, the Southern Baptist Convention is just the most recent of denominations of, of churches that have been exposed. I'm not trying to single them out. It's, it's sadly happened across all groups of Christianity. And there might be some of you here that has experienced abuse in the past, maybe from a church leader, or you have somebody close to you that has experienced abuse from someone at leadership in a church. And I, I want you to know, please know that God is righteously furious about that. He is not indifferent to it. He does not want you to keep your mouth shut on behalf of the church. That's not our God. We worship a God that flips tables and whips religious leaders that are manipulating his people. That is our God. Those leaders should be held fully accountable and we should be righteously furious. It should make our blood boil when we hear of these things. We should also pause and note that Jesus isn't flipping tables because non-Christians are hurting the church. It's because people inside the church are using the church for selfish gain rather than worshiping the one true God. We're quick to point the finger at other people. We're quick to point the finger at atheists or agnostics or political extremists for issues in the church. But Jesus spent more time criticizing the priests than the pagans. He spent more time criticizing the hypocrites inside the church than the heathens outside the church. Now, after all the commotion has happened at the temple, the Jewish leaders reply to Jesus. I think this whole story, this whole thing is about Jesus' authority. And I think this is where it really comes into view. So I'm going to try to prove that. But... Um, Jesus' authority reaches to every end of our lives. His authority stretches to every single piece of it. So in verse 18, the Jews are basically saying, what the heck do you think you're doing? If God really gave you the authority to do this, then give us a sign from him to prove it. And in verse 19, Jesus says, you want a sign? I'll give you a sign. He says, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. Now, they're standing on the city feet, maybe 10 feet away, maybe 10 feet away from the actual physical temple itself. So it was Jesus' intention for them to think that he was talking about that physical temple. In verse 20, they question Jesus because the second temple, the one that he was standing beside, the second temple was a modern marvel. It was a beautiful, humongous feat of human ingenuity to build such a massive temple. And it would have taken really expensive technology and very smart builders 46 years, nearly their entire careers, 
to build this structure. And it's still there. You, I, I went and saw it. You can go see it. Shocking. So now this angry Jewish man claiming he's God says, if you want a sign that I have authority from God, you should tear down this temple and I'll rebuild the whole thing in three days. <laughs> that is something a totally insane person would say. Like a total lunatic crazy man. That is something a total crazy man would say. <laughs> and that's exactly what they, th what they thought. That he was nuts. But John gives us an editorial clue so that we're not just as lost and confused as the Jewish leader leaders were. He says, Jesus spoke of the temple of his body. So if we can go back and reread what Jesus is saying, knowing what John's sharing with us, here's where we end up. Um, the Jews say, what authority do you have to come into the temple and literally turn our businesses upside down, uh, upside down on the busiest day of the year? And Jesus replies, if you kill me, I'll come back to life in three days. Jesus is saying he not only will show his authority over where we are to worship, but he'll show his authority over life itself. He's saying, I have authority over everything. It's all mine. The temple's mine. You're mine. This world's mine. Israel's mine. The universe. I have authority over every single thing you could possibly think of. It's all mine. It's all made for me. It's all made through me. It's mine. I have the authority over. In verse 22, it says, uh, they believe the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. And my question is, what would John have meant when he said the scripture? Because the, the gospel writings and definitely the letters of Paul weren't circulating yet. So he must have meant the Old Testament. So John is saying that they believed what David wrote. The disciples believed what Isaiah wrote. They believed Daniel and Micah and Samuel and Zechariah and Moses. They believed it all. It was all about him. Don't be fooled into this dangerous teaching that the Old Testament is not important or that it's just not as necessary or less necessary than the New Testament. John is saying it was just as important that they believed the words that Jesus is saying than to believe how Christ fulfilled the Old Testament. So John shares with us here uh, when, when the disciples believed the words that Jesus shared with them. And I can imagine if we fast forward to John 20, it's Easter morning. Instead of being in bright colors and being jubilant and seeing their friends, the disciples were terrified of the Romans. And they were hiding out in a locked room with their heads and their hands. And they thought their Messiah was dead and just buried in some tomb. And all of a sudden, a resurrected Jesus passed through the locked door and said, Peace be with you. And they must have freaked out. And as he showed them the holes in his hands and the wound in his side, their minds started rewinding like a movie, remembering the different teachings and the sayings and the events that happened that foreshadowed that very moment when he was standing resurrected in front of them. And John and the other disciples, they must have thought about the time that their sweaty, angry rabbi was standing outside on the street in front of the temple with coins laying on the ground and animals rushing around and a group of puzzled and angry Jewish leaders staring at him. And Jesus told them right in the middle of the street that the way he would display his authority to the world is by being killed and defeating the grave before the earth had a chance to revolve three times. John says he was never talking about the physical temple. He was talking about himself. The temple was a place that God dwelled and where humans could interact and meet with God. And John told us in chapter 1 that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So Jesus is God who put on human humanity to dwell among us. He is interacting and meeting the humans he created and planned to save. Jesus is the ultimate realization of the temple. We don't have to go to a physical temple anymore. We don't have to do that. Because God became a temple and came to dwell with us. There's no more sacrifices. No more waiting on the Messiah. God replaced the temple with himself. 
These are the thoughts that rushed through their heads as they saw his nail-scarred feet and his hands. Now, sometimes, just like the Jews in the story, Jesus comes into my life and metaphorically flips some things over. <laughs> Maybe you can relate. Often my response to that is, what authority do you have to come in and turn my life upside down? Why? And I don't want to tell you how often when things are going real and really bad in my life that I don't think that God really knows what he's doing. I think I know exactly how to fix it, and I question him for not doing it. If I'm broke, give me more money. If I'm sick, heal me immediately. You can do it. If I'm treated unfairly, he needs to correct that issue and make sure I'm treated fairly. Now, we don't actually indignantly ask God. I don't think we're dumb enough to actually ask that question. What authority do you think you have? But we act like he doesn't know what he's doing. I do. Rather than trusting in the God that has authority over life and death and everything, we trust in ourselves who have authority over absolutely nothing. And our culture backs this up. They say things like, bet on you. Do what you think is right. No, do not do that. Cast it all on him. If he's flipping tables in your life, don't fight to him, bow to him. Beg him to help you see things as he sees things. Beg him to conform your desires to his desires. He has authority over all things. We need to trust in the one that holds it all in his hands. Now, John gives us a wind down in these last few verses of chapter 2, talking about the rest of Jesus' time in Jerusalem during the Passover. And he uses a play on words here in the original language, which we try to show in, in, in the English translation. It just doesn't totally come through. It gets a little bit clunky. Um, but here's what, he, what he's saying. So John is saying that when people saw Jesus' miracles, they trusted him, but he did not trust them. That's what, that's what John's saying. Because in verse 24, it tells us Jesus knows the condition of all men. And he knew that the reason they believed in him was not because they knew that they were rebels, rebels who uh, were against or enemies of God that needed saving from his wrath, but instead they saw cool miracles and they believed that Jesus could help them or benefit them in some way. It's a self-interested belief that they had. Jesus was merely a means to an end. He was not the end itself. And some of you may think you believe in Jesus, but I'm convinced that there are some people here tonight that they really just believe in what Jesus can provide them. And there's a really popular branch of cultural Christianity heavy in Memphis, I've seen it, that doesn't see Jesus as a savior from their sins, but rather a savior from issues in life. Now, don't get me wrong. Jesus can certainly deliver you from problems in your life, but if all he is to you is someone that can get you out of hard situations and make you feel better, then you don't really believe in Jesus. You believe in a magical prayer genie. And I hope that throughout this text, what you've seen is John flexing the idea of Jesus' authority over all things. My brother, my older brother, is a pilot. And one time, he took me up in a small plane. It's the only time I've ever flown with him. It was a teeny tiny two-seater plane. Uh, it was like a shoebox with wings. Just very small, cramped, no air conditioning, <laughs> sketchy plane. Um, and when we took off, when our wheels left the ground and we started up, I thought that was the last moment of my life. I thought that we were going to die. Um, the wind was gusting. Um, the plane was flying sideways. I don't know if you know this, but if you're in a tiny plane, sometimes it doesn't fly like this, like big aircraft. It flies like, like this, like at a 45 degree angle. I didn't know that. That freaked me out. My palms were sweaty. I was grabbing the end of my shorts and just kind of white knuckling it and making sure he didn't notice. And after about five minutes though, my shoulders sat down. 
I started to relax. I, I got used to what was going on and started thinking through it. I thought, I know that my brother's well-trained. I mean, he's trained other people on how to fly. I know he's well-trained. I knew that my brother would never endanger me because he loves me so much. I know he wouldn't do something dumb with me or with my life. And I knew ultimately that there's nothing I could ever do to affect the situation. I don't know how to fly a plane. I don't know what the glowing buttons are. If I wanted to take over, I couldn't take over. <laughs> it would be useless. So then I sat down and I enjoyed as he flew us over uh, my childhood home in Arkansas, the church I went to, and, and just a really cool aerial view of like the whole area I grew up. It was awesome. We must understand the same things in our relationship with Christ. We must. He knows what he's doing. He's our father and he works everything for our good. He tells us that. And there's nothing you could possibly do to overthrow his authority, even if you tried as hard as you could. Even if it feels like you're in control. So we should do two things. We should pray differently and we should live differently. Okay? So we should pray in a way that takes us off the throne and puts God on the throne in our hearts. So desperately plead with the Lord to conform your will to his will. To desire the things he desires and accept what he gives you. He's a good father. And then we should live in a way that shows we're not in control and he is. So some of you are living as if God is not in control. And since things aren't working out in the way you thought they would, you've decided to take control. And it's not surprising that you're constantly tired and exhausted and stressed out all the time. Jesus says his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Whose yoke are you carrying? So I'd encourage you tonight to just rest. Rest in Jesus' full and total authority. 